So we are thrilled to have Craig and Zena here today. And they have asked me to do a special go-round um, that's going to have to do with what they're going to be talking about. And it's a little bit complicated. At okay. least I think the concept isn't as complicated as what it will happen when you start thinking about it. Um, as applied to yourself, because what we're going to do is we're going to ask you um, to think about a time that you were triggered and you behaved in a way that's not natural to you. Um, and it could be that you're, you were more withdrawn than you usually are, or it could be that you're more aggressive than you usually are. Um, if you, if it's hard, you know, I think the triggers are mostly unconscious, so it's hard to bring them up to our conscious mind. And if you're drawing a blank and you can't think of any time, or be mean to some people, and then that'll help. What? I'll be mean to some people. Okay. If you can't think of one for yourself, think of when you notice it in somebody else. Okay. Or think of something you saw on TV, or you know, an example of that. Does everybody sort of get it? No? So I'm sure he gets it. Okay. So we're talking about something that triggered you to behave in a way that you don't usually behave. Um, and I have a... I, so, and, and, and share it with the group. I have a trigger. I'm going to have to have you help me decide what it was. I had somebody who came to small times and absolutely would not listen to me when I told him what he had to do. And he really was adamant and just confronted me, and that's so clear that it happens that anybody behaves that way. And he just absolutely would not listen to me, and I found myself, you know, getting much more aggressive to him than I would ever like show any of the mediators that I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you call that? Aggressive behavior toward me, or? You're going to write it, so. It was, a, you know, it was probably a control issue. Okay. And so, say your name and what your trigger is, and my name is Sally Brush. Zena are here today to present um, a very, very important topic in the system, in the place of science. That's the first part, and then I'll be talking about ask, question. asking questions, yeah. So, he's the listening part, and I'm not asking. Okay. Okay. So, this is going to be interesting in terms of the timing and the way seating is, but Basically, if you have somebody who comes into mediation, they probably have some degree of anxiety or upset or whatever, or they wouldn't be there. And they want to feel heard. If nothing else, they want to feel heard. And so you, as a mediator, you sit down, you go through the opening statement, you go through the consent form, and and you hear the plaintiff describe the story. And that's cool. You can be there comfortably, probably pretty easily, very curious, interested. What's the story? Because for you, it's basically a blind slate other than whatever tiny write-up you saw ahead of time. Then, the defendant gets to talk, and you're still curious to see, OK, what's going to be the same versus different, but then the differences start showing up in the two stories and maybe a little more emotion because the defendant has to sort of overcome the, the truth that was already laid out by the plaintiff. And our minds are, one thing they're designed to do is fill in blanks and make sense out of whatever sensory information comes to it. So you have these discrepancies in stories, and so part of your mind automatically goes off and starts trying to resolve, okay, what's the truth? What is reality? And so that's sort of something we don't really have a whole lot of control over. It's just happening. Okay, so then stories go on, and you get into having to reframe the statements and acknowledge them and make them feel heard. And so, as a mediator, another thing, another chunk of your mind has to be in, okay, I'm the facilitator. I need to control what goes on here. What's happening next? Who gets to say how much? Is it time to interrupt and somebody who's repeating themselves too much? Uh, is it time to take a caucus? So, 
This is another chunk of your mind that's off sort of trying to oversee the whole process. So that's already a couple chunks of your mind that aren't focused on listening, just purely listening and understanding what the parties are saying. So that diminishes how much they're going to feel heard. And then somebody says something like, you are a liar. I don't believe what you're saying. You could not have been there to say such a thing. You must be lying. Or, uh, or you notice that somebody is just doing something with their fingers on the table. And, you, and your mind associates that with something your mother used to do when you were a kid. And maybe before she was about to get angry with you or something. Or any of these other triggers that you were just talking about, anything comes up. And it takes another big chunk of your mind, possibly, out of just being present comfortably with your partners and giving them the listening that they need to make any progress in coming to a settlement. So, uh, there are some exercises that we're going to attempt to do. Uh, and I think for the first one, rather than what we usually do is have people pair up and foot, you know, face each other. But for the first one, we can try it not doing that. No, I think we should. Yeah. That's the, the idea is, and if, if you want to go in the hall and do this, or if you just want to, it's better if the chairs are facing each other, but this is not going to work. How about if they stand it? Well, in this case, no, because it's very experiential. <laughs> so you can just sit in your chairs the way you are, but pair up with somebody next to you, one one other person, and jump. Shall we all whisper? You're not going to say a word. Oh, okay. Then oh, you can say a word while you're figuring out who you're paired up with. Okay. Oh, okay. But the exercise is. You're going to close your eyes, and you're just going to be aware. Wow. Be aware of the person you're paired up with. Uh, you can obviously be aware of what else is going on in the room, any sounds that you hear. Uh, but try especially to just focus on, even with your eyes closed, being aware of the fact that you're in front of this other person, and there's nothing else in the world that matters at all. And we'll do that for just one minute. Okay. No, I know I'm a I'm a do this. Eyes closed. And just stay still. Stay still and focus on your partner. Okay. I will. I'm gonna assume you're okay, if you haven't started already, start. Anybody have any comments on how easy it was to stay focused? Or, or were you thinking about what you're going to have for dinner or what you should be doing instead of being here? Phyllis? Well, it was a lot easier for me once the room got quiet. In the beginning, I, I heard lots of conversations. What are we doing? Why are we doing this? <laughs> so that, that was harder for me to focus. Uh -huh. Yeah. It, was, it was very easy for me because my partner had a very calm and soothing voice, so he really got the uh, process started actually for me. So it was very easy for me to close my eyes and kind of relax. Uh, Good. Other comments? Yeah. I thought it was easy for me because I was in the country because I kept trying to think of where do I know it from. <laughs> <laughs> Curiosity grabbed hold your attention. Yeah. I was envisioning Mark in my eye, in my, my mind's eye, and I just sat with that. Uh -huh. yeah. So as long as I saw Claudia's face in my head, I was okay, but then I got distracted and I lost it because I felt like I wanted more stimulation or something. Yeah, that's so common these days. We're so, I mean, one thing I do is I lead a monthly meditation group, and 
silent meditation. And sometimes I invite people to come to it and they say, oh, you got to be kidding. <laughs> They're just so used to so much stimulation, there's no way that they could be still in silence for any length of time. At least they f feel they could. Yeah. Are you aware of a Quaker organization in Ann Arbor on Sundays? They practice silence for 40 minutes. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that relatively easy. You don't have to see anything. It's just eyes closed, <laughs> and, and we're in a room with friends and all that. Okay, just up the level, one little notch, and this time, same thing with your eyes open. Hmm. And it's okay. They aren't going to bite you. It's, I promise. <laughs> Oh, I think we have some comments on that one. Uh, I was, with eyes closed, I was re we trained together, so I was remembering her and training what as she was doing her. We never actually were co no, facilitated. facilitated or anything in training, but her being in other events. But sitting here with eyes open, uh, it was I had to fight not to keep smiling because she was smiling and I wanted to creep up. And, and I said, no, if I go too far, it'll become a grimace. It was just interesting to, to, to not over-respond to her friendliness, I should say. Mm. And we have this mm -hmm. desire to interact with somebody when they're in front of us like that. And if you're not allowed to speak, then it's like, okay, all these facial expressions, smiling and acknowledging somehow their presence or... or Sometimes it's involuntary to break out laughing. What are you else having experiences? Yeah. Um, well, we were looking at each other, and I felt that we were both working hard, or maybe not working hard like that, but we were comfortable looking at each other. I, I found, um, I guess because I have interacted with Bill before, but it was uh, about halfway through I found myself just gazing into his eyes and, and thinking, this is Bill, who's Bill? I mean, it was kind of like, you know, sort of seeing the person behind face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I was just aware that in mediation the parties are thankfully a little further away from <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Did anybody, well, sometimes when I've done this in the past as part of trauma counselor training stuff, I find it easy, well, it's easy to be nervous. But it's also easy to like just almost fall in love with the other person just because that connection somehow. And I sometimes wonder, wow, wouldn't it be cool to be able to feel that for the parties and mediation and just operate from that sort of feeling? Okay, now we're going to get really tough here. Uh, in the beginning, we went around and talked about triggers. So, I'm not going to attempt to <laughs> list them all, but these are some that I put together ahead of time. Some examples, uh, but there's also the ones that you, what's best is to focus on one that you think you have for yourself. skipping a couple of these exercises here due to timing, but the idea is that how to maintain that level of comfort and just clarity and focus when somebody is hitting you with something that is a trigger for you. So your task, you dare take it on, is to, with your partner, pick pick one who's going to be who's going to go first as the listener and the other person is going to 
say something that the listener considers some sort of trigger for them. Say or do, if it's a mannerism, to try to do that, or some statement. Uh, so the listener will tell the, the coach something that they can use as a trigger for them that you would like to feel more comfortable being in the presence of, something you would like to feel more comfortable hearing. And then the coach person will say that over and over. Just, you know, say it, wait a few seconds, say it again. One more time. All right. Questions. <laughs> You're saying, give us an example of the sort of thing that the uh, listener says to the coach, tells the coach to use. Okay. Because yes, I know I was here for a reason. <laughs> Okay. <coughs> I'll be the listener. listener. Yes. Okay. And you are going to tell you I know all about self-driving cars. <laughs> no, we, we didn't. We didn't handle it. Oh, self she's going to tell me how she knows all about self-driving cars. And that's his trigger. <laughs> that's right. That's his trigger. Right. Even though you, I know nothing. You <laughs> saw some <laughs> Google, you know, some news announcement about it. Right. 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 Yeah, right. right. Well, I know that they've been driving around Ann Arbor already. I've seen them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so give me a few seconds after you say it, and then just say the same thing again. So I, I know that they're using the self-driving cars already because I've seen them around the internet. <laughs> so I know that they've got them already because I've seen them driving around Ann Arbor. Self-driving cars, that's great. Are you doing it? <laughs> so I know that we've got self-driving cars already. I've seen them driving around Ann Arbor. <laughs> so, that's, so that's the basic idea. Okay. And if the and the, the, the purpose the listener yeah purpose is for the listener just to <coughs> decrease any anxiety that comes up, decrease it a little bit, and get just you know if you feel like laughing at what the person says, you, I mean you can start off doing that or or saying stop. Just reacting somehow. Feel free to react at first, but then try to, to not react. Just try to, but not by squashing your own reaction, but rather by just being comfortable there, taking it in. And this is, I mean, this is obviously a contrived situation. It's not like with somebody you don't know in mediation where it's going to hit you probably a little harder. But just try this out. Okay. So. This is like a desensitization. Desensitization. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get the most out of it and figure out something that we're interested in. I'll tell you when to switch. Okay. Talking about it, having fun talking about it, but either way, it's good. So, comments, questions? Took me a while to find your trigger, but. <laughs> 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 yeah, <I heard. laughs> We're not going to share my. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. Share how you find sure. somebody's trigger. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It took a while to find it. Yeah, the interesting yeah. thing is when she shared something with me, and I went back at her, you could see that you could, you know, body language. You can see the twitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was really good. <laughs> <laughs> It's um, that um, yeah. tone of voice has a lot to do with it. Like if you're more high pitch and excitable, you can annoy the other person easier. <laughs> yeah, and then you can bring it down a few notches. Tense uh, on the voice. Yes. Oh no, we're talking about triggers. It's just that you know. The initial shock value, the initial, somebody said the initial is kind of, you know, and then you're trying to maintain a straight face, but after a while, when you hear different things so much, it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then well, the just trick is just not to just, just totally yeah. lose interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I said, because then you're like, okay. <laughs>
Anything else before we move on to Zena's? I don't, I don't think she believes in me if I lie. Oh, that's very entertaining. But not coming. No. We were thinking that in real life you don't get to practice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But one thing that's, yeah. You don't get to practice your triggers? <laughs> no, you don't get to practice when you are triggered. Like this time, I can kind of begin to think, now what could I say for that? Instead of, the way I want to react. <laughs> what could I say that might be helpful? Yeah. And we should not say <laughs> in real life, in real life, I wouldn't have that chance to practice. That's good. If you happen to notice something specific that comes up that is a trigger for you, then you can, if you remember it, then get together with somebody sometime later and say, "Hey, can you work through this with me? Just do it, just just like this, and pretend yeah. to be this person." Well, but now you see, I just tend to avoid people who trigger me. But now I'm thinking maybe I should, I should go have lunch with them. <laughs> Um, in the listening exercises we didn't do, how do you listen without interest? Oh, that's easy. Yeah. 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 Look at your body. Well, it doesn't have to be body language, but it will certainly often show up at least subtly in body language. Have you, have you never heard been through mediation where the other person doesn't seem to be paying any attention? No, I can watch that. I oh, oh, how, how I would be. Oh, oh, oh. But I like, see, you are putting or, on the Or if you're too busy, like, like say you're co-mediating. Mm, you're and, writing everything down? Yeah, you're busy already starting to write up the agreement points, <laughs> figuring that your co-mediator will take care of paying attention. <laughs> I think the real question is how do you validate a client you, you just, you know, how do you humanize it? Like someone really, it's not whether we like them or not like them because we're going to leave and it doesn't matter. But how do you reach that person? Like what's the technique that people use in that situation where when you're, you're triggered, in mediation you and someone is like saying something horrible or racist or whatever? Not diffuse it, but address it in a reality testing way. Most, the first most important step is simply acknowledging it. Saying, saying yeah, I, I hear you. Or saying, okay. Not, not necessarily saying you agree with them or anything, but just making sure that they get that you have fully heard them and understood what they were saying. That's, that's the important piece. Okay. Well, I ask for clarification. Mm -hmm. I heard you say this. Is this what you mean? You yeah, say? I mean, you can go into like an active listening kind of thing, feed it back to them, and clarify it. Yeah. Sometimes it's a, hmm. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like how I heard what you said. It registered. But I'm not committing to one way or another. I yeah. like that one. Was. Yeah. Or something like. Do you raise an eyebrow? <laughs> well, that, can also, that can also be taken as, yes. oh, they're interested, but they don't really get it. I gotta tell them more. Yeah. Get into a more of a Sounds a little too sensitive. I, I, I think we need to move on to make sure Gina gets. Uh, I want to practice those. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Back my, how would you, how Joe says we need a workshop on set of how to say. Special yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So no, I have material. That was different. That could affect the issues. Did you catch those? Yeah. yeah, thank you. I don't know why I have materials. You're not going to have time to do that. Yeah. Thank you. So, <clears throat> I was thinking about uh, this idea of open ended questions. Are there enough? I have a couple of extra. Oh, yeah. We need one more. One more? And I think we may need to have people share. Yeah, okay. we'll share. We know how to share. We know how to share. That's S H A N C H. Not too bad. <laughs> 
Um, and then somebody can have this when I'm done. I just need it to now. So, um, open-ended questions. First of all, what is an open-ended question? Requires more than a yes or no. Requires more than a yes or no. Good. What else? It's kind of neutral. It's kind of neutral. Neutral. Okay. Definitely way to get in the pocket. Yeah. But what is it? What do you mean by what? How would you define an open-ended question? Question that can have more than one answer. Certainly more than one. I think you're almost there. Yeah. You're trying to get their truth, not anticipate what they're going to say. Uh -huh. It makes discussion. Yeah. I, I think of an open ended question as a question that could be answered by anything. Hmm. Hmm. You're not giving people direction at all as to what to answer. Hmm. Uh, so, how are you? <laughs> open ended. They could answer anything, right? Or, why did you come here today? <laughs> they could answer almost anything. So it's <clears throat> that the answer could be, could come from so many different directions. As opposed to, and I could write down these other types of questions, but I think I may have put something in there that, that puts in the other types of questions. Um, <clears throat> so different from what I think of as directed questions, where you're picking a topic and asking somebody to tell you about that. So could you tell me more about the problems that you have with your neighbor? Right? Still a little bit open, right? But you're directing the course of it. You're saying, go on this road, <laughs> as opposed to all those other roads you could have. Um, or somebody mentioned a yes-no question, which is quite narrow, right? Where you're actually asking them to answer yes or no. So did you take this road when you came today? <laughs> yes or no, right? Or a leading question. Anybody know what a leading question is? Where you're actually answer. putting the answer it's into the, the question. Yeah. So you did use this road when you came today, didn't you? It would be a leading question. And then the other kind of question that I like to use is a framing question, which is to frame a question that would help the parties look at options for resolution. If we have enough time today, I'll go into that. But I know that we're focusing on totally open-ended questions, so I, I want to take a little time to do that. So we've defined an open-ended question, which is one that people could answer almost anything to. Um, and why is that useful? You said it's useful, but why? It gets, it gets you out of the way. Gets yourself out of the way, good. Mm -hmm. What else? It doesn't lead the other person. And why is that useful? Um, so that the other person can think of other <coughs> um, ideas. Yeah. So it gives us an inkling of what's going on with them. Right? Mm -hmm. It gives us an entry point into their thinking. Because they could have answered anything, and they chose that, that, that should have some meaning to us about what's going on for them. Right? Why else is it useful? Disarms people. It disarms and makes them know that you're not there to tell them what to do. It is very disarming because it makes it makes people think that you're interested in them, <laughs> whether you actually are or not. <clears throat> because you're asking really what's in your mind, <clears throat> and people love to talk. Most people love to talk about what's in their mind. <laughs> not everybody, but most people do. Some people will close down with an open-ended question, and so you have to watch out for that but not most people. Most people will open up with them. And <clears throat> we'd like people to open up in mediation. Why? These are not trick questions. <laughs> they're the ones who have to do the work. If they're yeah. not talking, they're not That's right. Yeah. If we can open them up, they're, they're going to do the work and then we don't have to. Yeah. They're going to be more engaged in the resolution of their own issue if we can open them up and start them talking. Absolutely. Um, why is it so hard to ask an open-ended question? Oh, when I forgot who was it, Andy, there's somebody who's a oh, Christian talking about tangents. I mean, if you, give, <laughs> if you give them sort of the world, 
um, to, to answer with, and they will, and a lot of times, or often, So we're relevant. kind of afraid to ask an open-ended question, because who knows <laughs> <laughs> what's going to come. That's good. Yeah. Also, as Craig was saying, we may already have a, have made an opinion that's going that will, if we're not careful, influence create a question that will go follow our opinion. Yeah, I think what's in our own minds really gets in our way of asking an open-ended question because we're <clears throat> running so fast, <clears throat> making conclusions about what's going on, that just to ask an open-ended question doesn't, it, it seems inefficient, is that a good way to put it? Mm -hmm. That it might get us off on the wrong track and then we're going to have to start coming back and, and then what about it? Um, and what else makes it difficult to ask an open-ended question? What you just said, does that um, link into a sense of wanting to control the situation? Yes. You might need Thank to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to ask, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we don't want to ask open-ended questions because we want to stay in control. And if we ask the open-ended question, we really hand it over to them to be in control. And then we're worried we're not going to be able to get that control back. And of course, any control is an illusion. Mm -hmm. Right. Are we all yeah. aware of that? Yeah. 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 No, of course not. <laughs> and so the idea that we actually were in control, or that we could get control back, forget it. <laughs> um, it's really more, can we help? <laughs> that was interesting. Or <laughs> can we redirect is really more the question rather than can we get control. Right? But even there we worry, can we redirect if they go off in, in a place we really don't want them? Or what if we ask that open-ended question and it really ticks off the other person? Right. <clears throat> the answer is just exactly what triggers <laughs> the other person. <clears throat> then can we ever get it back on track again? So there's that control issue. Somebody else had a hand up about why these are so hard to answer. How about four minutes? open-ended questions. Are they easy or difficult to form? Difficult. Why? Since they're such simple questions, why are they difficult to form? Simple is hard. Simple is hard. Yeah. Any other insights into it? Yeah. We're used to answering people for specifics. Yeah. And talking about specifics. Yeah, we're used to specifics. We're not used to just opening up a whole field. Yeah. And so we, we haven't practiced as much asking those questions. So actually, that's what you get to do today is to practice <laughs> asking open-ended questions <clears throat> because it is kind of difficult to do. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention before I, before I get into the practice is the when. Let's see if I put it in here like I thought I did. Yeah, on page two, there's the sequence of the stages of the mediation process. And as you know, we all, this is page three, I go on it's page three. And I have my glasses on, too. This is sad. Um, we all use different stages of the mediation process. I'll name them differently. This is taken from Susan Hartman, who got it into the acronym MEDIATE, which is wonderful. Um, but even though we may have different names for the stages, they're really all the same. You know that. <laughs> all the stages are the same. The stages. So if if you took a training that didn't use mediate, oh, okay. but used a different acronym, oh, okay. Thank you. still the same stages. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> um, so when in the process, when in these stages, would you want to ask open-ended questions? And when would you not want to ask open-ended questions in these stages? DNA. So you're talking about? Draw, drawing out information and interest, you would want to ask open-ended questions and then asking for options. Asking for options. So the drawing out information, for sure. <clears throat> Probably the M measuring readiness stage. You're going to ask a lot of open-ended questions just to find out what's going on, right? <clears throat> Explaining the process you're talking, so you're not asking as many questions. But yeah, so M and D for sure. Asking for <laughs> options is actually directed questions, <clears throat> not open-ended. Does that make sense? 
And that's where the framing of questions comes in, is really the actual process. Because <clears throat> I want to ask a question that will get them to give me options. I don't want to give them the whole world. I want to be very specific about what I want from them. Whereas drawing out information is more, you know, tell me everything. Give me everything you got. So it turns out that at the beginning <clears throat> of mediation, or the beginning of each topic, is where we like the open-ended questions. And then the further we go in the mediation, the more directed it comes, till we get to the end where we're asking a yes-no question. Can you agree to this? Are you willing to sign? <laughs> Here. So at the end, it really is a very closed yes-no question. In the middle, it's directed. But at the beginning is where it's wide open. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Okay. So <coughs> we were going to demo a little bit. Um, where Craig is just going to talk, this is the beginning of the mediation. I know nothing about what's going on. So I'm going to try to ask him open-ended questions. And I, I will try. I'm not promising that I will actually do it. So I will be happy to take critiques and suggestions if I'm not doing it right. So Craig, what's going on? Is that an open-ended open Pretty open-ended. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty open-ended. <laughs> uh, I'm in this, uh sort of workshop thing here and uh, <laughs> starting to wonder what sort of question you're going to ask me and whether I'll be able to talk about it or not. Huh. Well, is there a reason you came? Well, I came because I had to do my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so no, was, no, that, was, was that open-ended yeah. enough? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like rephrasing the first question. So you came because? Well, I came because I agreed to do the presentation and I wanted to you know, collaborate with you on this and see what you have to say. So, um, what do you think of it? I think it's going well. Uh -huh. uh, I could screw it up really bad right now, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. So, was that last one an open-ended question? What do you think? think so. Well, it's a little no, more. It's a little more directed. It's a little more it? yes or no. Yeah. yeah. So, the further we go into it, the harder it is to ask open-ended questions. But then the question is, are they appropriate at yeah. And... <clears throat> What is it I'm trying to find out from him? I found out why he came. Mm -hmm. Found out what his interest is. If, if <clears throat> he has any interest in open-ended questions at all, I might ask that question, right? It's a little bit directed, but somewhat open-ended. So, Craig, are you interested at all in the, the open-ended questions? And if so, yeah. what might interest you? I'm sure I have something to learn in that, because I, I, I really like focusing on specifics and trying to clarify specific things in the mediation. Uh, and I think I could learn something about doing more open-ended. So that seemed like it was open-ended enough that I got his thoughts, right? It wasn't, wasn't my choice. <clears throat> now, if I wanted to ask a directed question at this point, I might ask, so is there anything specific that you would like for me to present? Is this making sense? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. at this yeah. point, I might want to get more specific information sure. from him. Uh, maybe yeah. examples of open-ended questions. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. So is that enough of a demo? Do you kind of get it? So again, we would like you to find a partner. <clears throat> have each of you tell a story and have uh, one person asking open-ended questions. But we'd like you to think about every time you ask a question, is this open-ended or not? And if yes, was it appropriate for you to ask an open-ended question at that point? And if not, was it appropriate for it not to be open-ended at that point? Is that making any sense at all? Yes, and when you... That was a yes, no. Yes, and. <laughs> <laughs> when you get... It may be if your uh, first attempt at an open-ended question gets a response that leads you right into something quite specific, then how much you're open-ended. Then you may not need to do open-ended questions yes. anymore. That's right. So you might ask sure. repeat open-ended questions if you're not really getting enough information to be useful. Yeah. So in so for, ex for example, sometimes somebody will tell a story and I'll say, and anything else happened? Or was there anything else important? Because I'm thinking like there's more out there. Mm -hmm. Or I think I've got it, and I'll say, and then what happened? And then what happened? Which are more directed questions, right? So it's really more a question of are, are you getting the playing field that you want enough that you don't have to ask open-ended questions anymore? Or 
now there's more out there. I need more open-ended questions. <clears throat> However, you do have to watch that you don't irritate people by continuing to ask open-ended mm -hmm. questions that they don't answer. They may prefer more directed questions, in which case you would go and ask. What about the opposite, where somebody's rambling on and on, and you want to then shut them up? Then you want to ask directed questions. How do you shut them up? You would ask a directed question. Mm -hmm. So um, go on and on, and I'll ask a directed question. Oh, it's, you know, the counters in the kitchen just broke, and then the water leaked, and, so and, and the counters just more broke. more <clears throat> about why you decided to come today. So does that make sense? Yeah. In other words, it's perfectly okay to just plain interrupt. Oh, yes. All Does everybody right. know that rule? No. So, oh, I, this, is, this is one of my favorite rules. So, we very seriously tell people, no interruptions. It does not apply to us. <laughs> it does not. Because if we couldn't interrupt, we'd be, number one, we'd be there forever. And number two, the power balance would be completely unworkable. My favorite story, can I tell you my favorite story? Oh, please. This was a professor, of course, because professors profess. <laughs> and he would, any time he talked, he would go on for, I swear, 15 minutes. I'm sure it wasn't, but it really felt like it was 15 minutes. And his wife <clears throat> would answer in two-word sentences. <laughs> that would be go, <laughs> and it just, it felt so unbalanced to me. It was really bad. So, about the third time that he went on, on, I interrupted him. And he looked at me and he said, don't interrupt me. Yeah. Oh. I met, he's the only person in my, in my whole history of mediation, which is a long one, who's ever done that. But that's why I remember it. And I, I looked at him and I said, really, I have to interrupt you. No, no, don't interrupt me. It's rude to interrupt. So I said, it may be rude, but if I can't interrupt you, I actually can't mediate. So it is your choice. If you want me to mediate, I have to be able to interrupt. But if you don't want me to mediate, that's fine. We don't have to. <laughs> Did you that's tell great. him why? Well, I, I would have if he had pushed it. I mean, I could see that he got that he was going on and on. <laughs> I mean, he liked that. Yeah. You know? yeah. He didn't want to be, but he, he got why I had to do it. But if he hadn't, I would have explained to him that I have to be able to direct the process or anything. I mean, I could have gone on about it. Yeah. So finally, after I said that, he looked at me exactly like this. All right. <laughs> you can interrupt, but it's rude. <laughs> That's my favorite interruption. <laughs> but yeah, so isn't it odd that he's the only person in my 30 plus years yeah. of mediation that's ever said that because it's so true I tell everybody don't interrupt and then I proceed to do it immediately right but we have to we have to interrupt because if we can't we can't really direct it to to where it needs to go now this is not peacemaking right, right. peacemaking is a whole right. different but for mediation <clears throat> we are trying to direct it through a curvy path but at least a so, <clears throat> you ready to, to get in pairs again? Yes, could you review what we're Yes, talking? so, you're telling a story <clears throat> of some sort, and the other person is, is starting out with an open-ended question, right? So, the first question needs to be open-ended, and then a few open-ended questions after that. But I would like you to observe the questions. It, was this open-ended? Was it not? If yes, appropriate. If not, appropriate. Okay. Will it be helpful if the other person is not getting right to a specific story? You know, if the story is not so specific, then it doesn't. Yeah, you can do it either way. Do it either way. Ready for it? Find your partner in the world. So, so you're only going to spend like three minutes each. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. So. How many people experienced that, that it was, you were able to ask one open-ended question, but you were really having a hard time doing it again? How many people couldn't even do the first one? I think we did well with both of our teachers, and we agreed that oh, we were both good at cheating. <laughs> we both taught, she taught ESL and I taught French, so we were, we were both experienced in getting people to talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, That's great. But, but I, 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 there's a case. Difference. Can I say that now, or you don't want to? You're fine. Yeah. Go. Um, 
when I'm mediating versus having this conversation, I am not so interested in getting, um, you know, I'm not going to see them tomorrow. But in this case, I want to get to know this woman more. I know her from mediation. And I sincerely want to know more of the story so I know her later. So with mediation, it's insincere, is that what you're saying? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to speak. I want to get as much open-endedness. In fact, I think I, I probably err on the other side of asking too many open-ended questions. Oh, in interesting. interesting. Because I do feel, I was telling her, I do think it's a miracle that this, this process is, it does work. And I think it works because we allow them to talk. I mean, this friend said she lets them talk too much. I don't know if you can ever let them talk too much. I mean, I understand yes, that. But I yes, <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, but, but it's, it's a tremendous process. It's a, it's a one time, it's a one time a lifetime that you're going to be able to talk this thing out that you've been so angry about for months. And right, and you know the the what Craig was talking about earlier that we offer to people, the gift of listening, is such a gift. Right. I mean, if, if you ever ask people how often do you really feel listened to, it's so rare that it is a gift that we give people by listening. And, and then the open-ended questions are the way that's the entree into the listening that we do. So, yeah, it's true, we don't want to interrupt very much. And one of the things that I do, which I get to do because I'm a private practitioner, is that I interview people separately first, mm -hmm. on separate days if I can, mm -hmm. so that they can take as much time as they want, because they're paying me, mm -hmm. and tell their whole story. Mm -hmm. um, and the other person isn't there to object to any of it. <clears throat> and it is, it, it, it is a real gift to give people. And it also means, the other reason I like it is because it means when they get in with the other person, they don't have to repeat it. <laughs> So it's much shortened once they get there. But yeah, in that separate session, it's open-ended question mm -hmm. after open-ended question after open-ended question. Would you ever suggest that we sort of almost at the beginning caucus and talk and, and hear from the separate parties before we get really into So what I don't know is what the constraints are in your particular mediation situations. Um, but I tend to do that as often as I can. Even when I come in to volunteer, I'll tell somebody to come in a half an hour early mm -hmm. and then go away and the other person. So I'll give each person about a half an hour, if I can, um, ahead of time. Just because it does give people that opportunity to say what they need. Now, a half an hour is not a lot for some people <laughs> and way too long for others. So, I mean, it's just a guess as to, as to what will do it. But apparently you have been able to compare these two because you don't do it all the time. Do you find that that is quite helpful to I do. start out with these? Separate? I do, because it gives me an idea of what's going on. One of the things, you probably noticed, one of the things that happens when you just walk into a dispute is that people tend to talk in code. Mm -hmm. Especially that's if they're... Right yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. It's their own code. It's how they've been either... Um, uh, Taught either understanding or not understanding mm -hmm. each other, right? The, sometimes it is a code that they do understand each other with, and sometimes it's total non-communication. But if but we don't know what that is, and I find that if you talk to people separately, you get a clue about what that code is. Um, and I get a clue about <clears throat> when somebody says a phrase in mediation, what the background of that phrase is. So it sort of gives me more of an insight into sort of the depth of what's going on. So I, I have to say I love it, but it's a luxury to be able to do that. You can't always do that. And small claims is a good example. If you just, there's just absolutely no way you could ever do it. <clears throat> on the other hand, small claims is so entertaining in and of itself. It's its own reward. I wouldn't give up any of it. <laughs> Zena says it's where the rubber hits the road. <laughs> it's where I learn about America. <laughs> So, but you were talking about the difficulty of asking open-ended questions. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, we found once we got, once the person began to tell their story in specifics, we either wanted to make a statement about what they said. So, like a mirroring yes. acknowledgement of validation. Right, mm -hmm. right. Or we wanted to uh, go down the path that they were going down. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, I think that can be absolute, that was why I was saying, if you ask an open-ended question, was it appropriate? If you don't ask an open-ended question, was that appropriate? Uh -huh. And so I think if 
they're going down a path that's worth following. Yeah. Well, you may not need to ask any more open-ended questions. Okay. On the other hand, if you're feeling like, yeah, I haven't quite got what's going on. Okay, so if we, if we, instead of being specific to each other, we had told a story that was, uh, yeah, that might have been helpful. Well, no, because then you might need directed questions yeah. to pull you back. Okay. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so if you had been very specific about something, uh -huh. but I'm feeling like you're leaving half of it out, uh -huh. I might okay. have asked another open-ended question. So, did anything else happen? Okay. Or okay. was there any other reason that you came? Okay. Uh -huh. But you're right. A lot of the times, because you are so good, one open-ended question may be sufficient to get them talking. Uh -huh. Right? And if it's not, that's when you have to think, okay, do I want to follow the path that, they, that they're going on, or do I really want more information from the other side that I need to ask more open-ended questions? Okay. Did anybody have trouble even formulating an open-ended question? So I just want to tell you how unusual a group you are. <laughs> well, you've had us it's, some beforehand. Of yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because most group, most people just don't know how to even ask an open ended question. So you guys, you have to applaud yourself, right? Yeah, really good. So I know, are we out of time already? Oh, yeah, we're totally out of time. So sometime bring me back and I'll talk about framing questions. <laughs> but, but that, those, I listed the types of questions there. Yep. Just one comment. Did you, does everybody understand, did, did anybody realize that both the word listen and silent have the same word, oh. the same letters in it? Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Isn't So thank you, Craig and Tina, very much. Very